Hello, welcome to this lesson of the Laplace Transform Tutor. Uh, here what we're going to do is kind of summarize what we have done in the previous several sections. What we've done in the previous sections is derive the Laplace Transform for some very common functions that you see all of the time. And we went through all of the mathematical rigor to do that um, in all of its glory to give you practice with how to do it by hand and also because it's very common to be asked how to do at least some of that stuff on an exam. But the reality of it is that in order to use the Laplace transform as a tool, what we usually do is we uh, summarize the core functions in a table, and then we basically use those results and apply them to, you, you'll see in a minute how we can take that and apply it to different types of problems and kind of use them as building blocks to take transforms of more complicated functions. So basically what we're doing is summarizing those results here. Before I do that, I want to mention a few things to you. And the first thing is, um, for instance, the notation that we have been using is the following. That the Laplace transform, we're saying it's capital F as a function of S, and we're saying that's equal to the Laplace transform of F of T. That's the notation that we've been using so far. So far, all we've been concerned with is taking this function of time, performing the integration on it, getting a function of S, and we call that the Laplace transform of the function of time. What we haven't said so far is that the reverse is also true. I've hinted to you about it. I basically said, hey, we're going to transform into the Laplace domain, which is called the S domain, and then we'll solve our problems in the S domain, which should be simpler, and we'll get an answer in terms of S, and then we'll transform it back to a function of time. This going back into a function of time is called the inverse Laplace transform. And you would write it like this. You would say, if the Laplace transform f of s, capital F of s, is equal to Laplace transform of some function of time, then we would say that the reverse is also true, that the function of time can be recovered by taking something called the inverse Laplace transform of f of s. All right. Not much more to say other than that. It's just that the Laplace transform is a reversible beast. It's a reversible transform. Transform from the time domain into the S domain. Do your business. Transform back from the S domain to the time domain. There's a one-to-one -one correlation between functions of time and functions of S. You can go backwards from functions of S to functions of time. That's what makes the transform useful. It wouldn't be too useful if, if we could transform to S and then we'd try to go backwards and we're not unable to do it. So this notation, this uh, curly L with a negative one, means inverse Laplace transform uh, there. And you'll see how we do these inverse Laplace transforms as we go through the course. Basically, it's going to be boiling down to rec recognizing what they look like and our table of Laplace transforms, which we're going to uh, put up on the board here in a minute. Now, the next thing we want to talk about uh, is a couple of properties of the Laplace transform. Laplace transform. So the first property is the Laplace transform is linear. And what do I mean by linear? It's something that you probably already assumed is the case anyway, but we're going to uh, write it down explicitly here on the board just to make sure that everybody's on board with that. And what that means in terms of this is very similar to how integrals work. Because think about it, a Laplace transform really is just an integral. What it's basically saying is if you have the Laplace transform of some constant, we'll call it C1, times some function of time, and then you have another constant times another function of time, right? So in other words, this is like a linear combination of two functions. So here's like a sine, and here's like a cosine, and there's like a three in front, and a two in front, or whatever. But there's two different functions, and you have constants in front, and they're linked by a plus sign. This behaves exactly like integrals. Um, it basically boils down to C1 Laplace transform of the first function of time plus C2 Laplace transform of the second function of time. So notice a couple of things here. The first thing is we were able to break it up so that you can apply the Laplace transform to each term separately. So here the Laplace transform is applied to F1 and then we're also applying the transform to F2. This is just like integrals. If you have the integral of x plus x squared, 
you just apply the integral to x and you apply the integral to x squared and then you basically add those two things together. That's what we call linear. The reason it behaves this way is because the Laplace transform is an integral. That's the reason why. Second thing is notice how this constant c1 came outside of the L. This constant c2, think about it distributing in, came outside of the L. That's because constants can move outside the integral sign uh, in calculus. Since the L here is basically an integral, it makes perfect sense that the Laplace transform would, would behave this way. So keep that in mind. The second thing we want to say is that the inverse Laplace transform, LT is what I'm going to use to start saying Laplace transform, is also linear. I don't really think I probably need to write it again, but I will anyway just for completeness. What we're basically saying is if you're trying to take the Laplace, the inverse Laplace transform of some uh, linear combination of um, functions of s, right? So c2, f2, s. Based on how it behaves up here, how do you think this is going to behave? It's going to be basically the same thing. It's going to be c1 inverse Laplace f, it's going to be capital F of s plus C2 inverse Laplace F2 of S. So again, it's basically saying the same thing. The Laplace transform and its inverse, they're both linear. And that just means that if the operator is acting on a, on a combination of, of two functions that are linked either addition or subtraction, and they can even have constants in front, then you just apply the inverse transform to each function separately, link them with a plus, and the constants just come out in front, basically just like integrals behave. So we just want to write that down because what's going to happen is we're going to learn how to transform these little individual chunks. Notice now we know how to transform a sine and a cosine. Now we know how to transform sine plus cosine because they're linear combinations. We just apply it individually to each little part. Basically, so it just basically behaves like calculus because the Laplace transform is calculus. No, no big surprise there. Uh, now, what we want to do is we're going to begin to construct our table. Now, what we're going to do is begin to construct our table of. Let's write this correctly. Table of essential. Transforms. All right, this is basically a summary of what we have already basically uh, done. Let me go ahead and underline that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write this on the board and I'm going to leave it on the board. And as we work problems going forward, we will refer back to that. Uh, as we work problems. Now in your textbook, whatever book you have, you probably have an old differential equations book or maybe you're learning Laplace transforms in some other class. Whatever class it is, it's probably going to have a table of Laplace transforms somewhere. So get comfortable with that and compare it to what we're writing down here. So the first one is what we've already talked about. Um, it's basically saying the Laplace transform of e to the lambda t, where lambda is just some number, we found out from der derivation is 1 over s minus lambda. So the Laplace transform of an, ex of an exponential is 1 over s minus lambda. Whatever value of lambda is what you put in here. All right. And then I'm going to also put a double arrow here. I'm going to say, I'm going to put a double arrow. And you'll see why in a second. Um, because of this, the inverse is also true. The inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s minus lambda is equal to e to the lambda t. So what we're going to have as we construct this table is we're going to have the Laplace transforms on the left, and we're going to have their corresponding inverse transforms on the right. And really, the inverse transforms, you can read right off of, off of this side of the chart as well, because the inverse transform really is just going backwards. So in other words, if I have if I'm trying to go from the time domain to the s domain, if I see an exponential, I treat it like this. Now, forget about that. If I'm trying to go backwards from the s domain back into the time domain, if I ever see a 1 over s minus some number, I can inverse transform that by recognizing it and putting it as an exponential. Whatever value for lambda is here is goes inside of the exponential. So they're one-to-one -one duality of one another. Now, let me change color so we try not to clutter things up too much. And let's go down below here. We'll say 
Laplace transform of the number one. We have already derived that, and that's really a special case of what's above. We say it's one over s. Because if you think about it, when lambda is zero, this return, this is basically resolves to one, which is this. So lambda would be zero. If you put lambda zero, you get this. So basically, this comes from this. I'm putting it there because you take Laplace transforms of, of, of constants quite a lot. Um, so you know, we need to know how to handle that. And then I will draw the double arrow, which means you can go back and forth. And then what we're basically saying is the Laplace transform inverse of 1 over s is equal to 1. Okay, so far it's pretty easy to understand. Laplace transform inverse uh, going from s back into time, going from s back into time. So let's go ahead and change colors and go on to the next one. Again, something we have already learned. Let's say the Laplace transform of uh, t to the power of n. We said it was equal to n factorial over s to the n plus 1, to the power of n plus 1. That was the transform. And for the inverse transform, it's going to look a little bit differently, and I'll explain why in just a second. But basically, the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s to the n is equal to t to the n minus 1 over n minus 1 factorial. So this is the first one on the list where the inverse transform looks a little bit different. Let me just stop for a second and just cover this up. Just forget about that for a second. If you know that the transform of t to the n is equal to this, then you also know that if you ever see this, if you take the inverse transform of this, you can get back to this. Of course that's true. The problem is, whenever you're confronting a problem like a differential equation or some other problem you're trying to, 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 to do an inverse transform, rarely are you going to be able to recognize if you have something factorial on the top. In other words, you'd have to know is it that you, you would see a number up here on the top like 1032. And then you would have to know that that was like 7 factorial. I don't know, I'm just making it up. But in order to apply this, you have to be able to recognize factorials, and that's pretty unlikely for you to do whenever you're solving a problem. It also kind of requires there to be a large number on the top that, that resolves to a factorial that then you can reply the reverse. So this is a slightly different way of recasting it. Notice it looks very similar. You have 1 over, or n factorial over s to the n plus 1. Here you have inverse of 1 over s to the nth. And then on the other side, you have t to the nth, which does show up here with a minus 1, and then you have an n minus 1 factorial. So it's almost like we move this over here, and then we change the exponent a little bit. So you kind of have to trust me a little bit. I, I, I told you in the beginning, some things I think are worth deriving, and I've done some derivations for you. Some things I think aren't, and I don't think this is really worth it. Just suffice to say that the transform of this is equal to this. If you happen to see this, of course you can go backwards. But this is a much more useful form. It's basically going from this and recasting it into something that you see much more commonly. It's much more common to see in a, um, in a function of s, 1 over s squared, or 1 over s to the fifth, or 1 over s to the ninth, and then be able to recognize that and stick it in there, and so you would get t to the n minus 1 over this factorial. That's much more common for you to see in a real differential equation or a real problem than to recognize that you see a factorial in your function of s and then go backwards. So your book may look a little bit different, um, but this is what I'm going off of. And so whatever you see in your book for this is going to be very, very similar to this. But in any case, they're basically trying to represent the same thing. So the inverse transform of when you have 1 over s to the power of n, um, you get that. And also notice that, you know, just to, just to show you, we use this as a special case. We already said the inverse transform of 1 over s is 1. That's extremely common to see that. That's why we write it separately there. So if you were to check this, though, and say, okay, let's take the power of 1 here. This is 1 over s to the first power. Let's put it in here and say, what if n is equal to 1? Then what you'll get is t to the power of 1 minus 1. So t to the 0 is going to give you 1 on top, right? And then on the bottom, you'll have 1. So you have 1 minus 1 is 0 factorial, which is also 1. So you have 1 on the top, 1 on the bottom. Anything, uh, anytime you have 0 factorial, it's by definition, even though it seems weird. 0 factorial is by definition equal to 1. So you've proven to yourself that this kind of works, because when you take 1 and stick it in here, it kind of resolves to what we get there. So enough talking about that. The next thing we want to discuss is the Laplace transform 
of cosine beta times t. And we said that that was equal to s over s squared plus beta squared, right? Now, again, we can then, just by looking at this, we can say to ourselves with certainty that if you ever see this, you can take the inverse transform uh, and get that. So we'll just draw our double arrow, and we'll say inverse Laplace transform of s over s squared plus beta squared is equal to cosine beta t. Just like that. So again, transforming from s uh, from t gives you s, inverse transforming from the same function of s gives us and recovers our function of t um, exactly. And the final one that we'll put on the list is the last one that we've derived by hand, which is the Laplace transform of sine beta t. We said that that's equal to beta over, do it like this, s squared plus beta squared. All right. Now, I'm going to obviously tell you that if you see this exactly, then you can go backwards and, and recover sine of t. But a slightly more useful way of recasting the exact same thing, it looks like this. 1 over s squared plus beta squared is equal to 1 over beta sine beta t, like that. That's a little bit more useful, and basically all that you're doing here, I mean, if you go from here to here, then you can obviously, if you inverse transform this, you're going to get your sign back. But what's going to end up happening is, um, see, when, when I'm scanning my, my Laplace transform, my function of s, and I'm trying to see how to recover it, if I use this form, then there has to be a number on the top, that same number has to be squared down here, and only when it's in that form am I able to go backwards. But see, this is just a number on top, and these are all integrals. So if I go inverse transform this back, I can basically take this function, one over this beta out, and move it to the other side, which is all that's what's happened here. That's why it's one over beta. And this is a little bit easier of a form to deal with because now I can scan through. All I have to look is, is one over s squared plus beta squared, or s squared plus some number squared and then I just stick it over here. I'm not required to see some matching number on the top. So basically it's a table, it's a slightly different recast version of what you see here. Certainly I could just e not even give you this stuff and just give you these Laplace transforms and say you can go back and forth like this, but in this form and in this form, it just so happens that these pop up in problems a little bit more frequently and, and, and you can apply it in more situations if it's recast like this. But just keep in mind that it's restating the exact same thing as what we're talking about right here. So here's our table of essential Laplace transforms. We've derived every one of these. Every single one of these directly comes from the derivation, basically just going backwards. And what you're going to find is that just with this, these five, uh, one, two, three, four, five Laplace transforms, you can do a whole lot of stuff um, as far as solving problems. So what we're going to do going forward is we're going to get some practice with taking these Laplace transforms. And I don't really mean by doing more integrals. We've done integrals. We've derived things. What we're going to do now is we're going to learn how to use these as building blocks. Building blocks to transform more complicated types of functions. And we'll see how to do that here in just a second. Once we understand how to uh, transform back and forth uh, more complicated types of functions using these as building blocks, then we'll solve some differential equations and you'll learn how to use Laplace transform for something useful, which is kind of the whole point. We'll do that and then we will continue to expand on the properties of Laplace transforms and, and basically just incrementally increasing our skills with it. The, the end goal is really just to be able to solve these problems easier. We're going to crawl before we can walk. Follow me on to the next lesson. We'll finally get some practice applying these guys to solving more and more types of, of functions and transforming them back and forth from functions of s, functions of t, back and forth between one another.